Bruce, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you for having me. Good to see you, Kevin. We're really excited to talk about your book, Future Proof, Nine Rules for Being Human in the Age of Automation. Not merely because of the topic area, because just in reading the first chapter, you realigned, speaking to the title of this podcast, my perception of this issue, when you made the really interesting point that the way our discourse on automation and everything is typically gone, it's focused on working class people. This probably has something to do with Andrew Yang and the discourse around UBI. But the point that you're making in this book is that looking into the future, this very well is going to be an issue which is going to affect white collar persons. So a good place to start is let's just talk about your evolution of thought on this topic, going from being optimistic, semi-anti-Luddite, to where you basically stand on publication date. Yeah, so when I started covering tech um, almost a decade ago, I was very optimistic about AI and automation. I thought, you know, this is going to be um, this is going to be great for people. You know, it's going to reduce the sort of number of mundane and repetitive tasks that we're doing. Um, and I was very skeptical of the kind of Yang style arguments about you know robots are going to come and take all the jobs. Um, and then I started sort of actually researching um, AI and automation. And I found that there's like a couple things that I think we get wrong in this debate. One is I think we're wrong to start having this debate in the future tense. This is happening to people right now. People are losing jobs. They're being displaced. Um, and that's happening in blue collar workplaces. But more that that stuff has largely already been automated. So now the the real progress that's being made in AI is figuring out how to replace white collar knowledge workers. So people who are, you know, doing revenue forecasting and production planning and like all those kind of like analytical sort of managerial class jobs, um, those are all being automated at a, at a furious rate. Um, and and I also think we make the mistake of 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 thinking that this is about sort of, um, you know, that this is about sort of physical robots, um, and and mostly that's a you know a science fiction trope, uh, but a lot of this stuff is happening through software, and um, and so as I sort of researched what's been going on in the world of automation and, and AI, I I got very pessimistic about not the technology itself, which I still think it has a lot of potential, but the humans who are implementing the technology. So I call myself a sub-optimist now. I'm not a pessimist because I still think a lot of this stuff could be really good, but the way it's being implemented right now is, is not so good. And a lot of the times companies are just aiming to replace people, get them off their payrolls and not to make their working conditions better or make them more productive. We're approaching this in a very like substitutive way instead of trying to figure out how to use technology to help workers, to empower them, um, and to make them more productive. This is the perfect opportunity for you to tell the boomer remover story, which just illustrates A, the replacement part, but B, if we're looking to the political aspect of this, we'll get into in a bit how this is going to become contentious very quickly as we go into the 2020s. Yeah, so this was an amazing moment. It happened pre-COVID. I was at a party in San Francisco, and um, and I you know started talking to this guy, and he introduced himself and said, you know, I have an AI startup, and I said, oh, what, what does your AI startup do? And he said, well, you know, we take we 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 call it the boomer remover, and I was like, boomer remover, and essentially he he makes a software product that allows factories to kind of like. Uh, automate their production planning. So what what machines should be making which things on which days? And that has been a job for a long time that's been done by humans. And his product, he was saying, would, would you know, allow these factories and these companies to replace all their, their boomers, their overpaid, you know, middle managers with mm -hmm. software. And like, that was a remarkable conversation, not only because it was like, you know, it was sort of a, a catchy name, but it was like corporate leaders are very, very reluctant to admit that this is what they're doing. Um, generally, if you talk to, you know, CEOs of big companies, they'll say, yeah, we're automating, but we're not, we're not trying to replace workers. We're trying to, you know, make them, you know, free them up and give them a, a chance to work on higher value tasks. But this guy was just coming out and saying what I think a lot of them feel deep down, which is, you know, this is going to be great because it means we don't have to employ as many people. Right. I think the important point that I took away kind of from your book and the points you're making there is that 
The quiet part out loud is now, not only is it being said, but a lot of the fear in the white collar workplace around implementing this and having possible political backlash is basically gone as a result of COVID. So let's tease that out. Why exactly did that happen? Is it just because of the sheer like workforce, plus everybody's got the excuse now like, hey, we gotta cut costs, sorry everyone. What does that look like? And what might political backlash look like on the other side? Because I think that's another one thing we should keep in mind. Yeah, well, I, I this is a really important point and one that I think you're really smart to call out. I think that the COVID has changed the automation picture in a couple ways. One is it has dramatically sped up the adoption of AI by companies, both for sort of reasons that, you know, they're trying to keep their factories working while the humans are, you know, out sick or they're trying, you know, meat packing plants and mm-hmm. FedEx and all these companies are sort of automating more just to kind of stay on top of their existing orders and their their sort of you know their business, um, but then there is this other group, and I, I just wrote a piece for this in the Times last weekend about sort of the the effect that COVID has had on giving executives a cover to do the kind of automation that they wanted to do anyway. Um, and I talked to you know a couple consultants, people who who do this work inside companies, and they were saying, yeah, like a year or two ago executives would say, oh, I could automate the billing department, but, you know, people would get mad at me and I don't want to be seen as a job killer. And and the technology actually isn't that much more productive than the workers anyway. And I don't want the mayor of my city, you know, calling me to yell at me. Um, so I'm just going to leave that for now. And COVID has really sort of sparked uh, a, a confidence boost for those for those executives to say, well, let's just go ahead and do this because people are out of work. You know, no one's going to blame us for cutting costs right now. And and if the technology exists, we would be, you know, we would be stupid not to use it. So they're doing it at a, at a pretty astonishing pace. Yeah. And I just wanted to underscore, because I think when we say white collar, we have to try and define like, what does that look like in the workplace? You pointed out, you know, an accountant. I was listening to your uh, appearance, I think, with Peter Kafka, and I really, it really resonated with me because you were talking about your intro level job in journalism was basically like taking, what was it, earnings reports and then like writing that up. I did the same thing. Like I came up in the aggregation game, like, you know, when I was 22, like that's how you do it. You get, you get good at li- writing a lead and, and, and these other like things. And it was formative. I'm not defending it, you know, necessarily, but that is basically a job that can be done through automation now. So what are the types of jobs that are going to get automated out of the white collar workplace uh, that we can visually see, accounting being one of them, entry level journalism. What are some of the other ones that people might have a better idea of to get a grasp on this? Well, the Brookings Institution and Stanford did a study um, a few years ago about this, and they they basically compared, they took the job descriptions that were available on public job sites, and they compared them with the language of patents for AI related innovations. And they found like the phrases that overlapped, like, you know, make mm. prediction or generate recommendation. And, and then they use that to say, okay, what are the fields where, um, where automation poses the biggest risk to workers? And they found that it was not blue collar work. It was not, you know, it was, it was not like manual data entry. It was a lot of things like, like, you know, marketing, um, like internal communications, like, you know, like, sales forecasting, um, you know, there, and, and I think this is like the kind of job that there are a surprising number of in the, in the workforce is like these kind of jobs that take an element of sort of routine repetitive work, but pair it with some sort of decision-making, um, like a, like a loan officer is a job that is really, really in danger right now. And, and Mm -hmm. there are many, many of them, um, you know, I, and I, and I think that the sort of perception of this as a, as a blue collar problem is really keeping people from understanding that they need to do some work ahead of this to make themselves less replaceable. Yeah. And let's, let's stick with the idea of defining terms because also something you hit out pretty early in the book is that automation doesn't equal AI and there's a lot of things within the spectrum. So can you just sort of articulate what these ideas basically mean? Yeah, so automation, AI, uh, robots, these things all have sort of evolved meaning over time. Um, I think the way a lot of computer scientists talk about AI is is that it involves software that learns on its own. So machine learning, um, you know, the 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 technology is not just it's not just sort of rule based algorithms like if this thing says this, then do this other thing. Um, that they would consider automation, but not AI. Um, and, and so AI is sort of the, the cognitive layer on top of the sort of automated layer, if that makes sense. Huh. 
That's interesting. I mean, whenever we're thinking about AI automation and more in the workplace, who are, what are the decisions there to be made? And one of the things you said, which was really interesting, is how part of the problems with the Trump era is that it actually obscured like there were giant leaps forward in technology uh, that we just basically didn't pay attention to. So what does that look like? I know you mentioned machine learning, deep learning, et cetera. What would that look like, like in my workplace or in another person's workplace that they can identify and say, oh, wow, actually, like things have changed exponentially and I just didn't even realize it. Well, there's, I think there are two frontiers here that we need to pay attention to. And one is the cutting edge technology, the stuff that's coming out of Google and Amazon and, and you know, Facebook and, and, and the research labs. And that stuff is just blowing through all the benchmarks. So we now have, you know, AI that can, um, that can diagnose certain types of cancers much more accurately than human radiologists, for example. Right. Um, and, and we now have software that can do parts of contract law better than trained contract lawyers. Um, so that's a type of work that, and that's that's sort of the, the frontier stuff. And then there's this kind of trailing frontier, which is like, when does all this stuff actually get put into products and like pushed into corporations? And that's what's just starting to happen right now. The stuff that was on the cutting edge five or six years ago is now being sold to big companies. They're putting it into their operations and they're using it to get rid of workers in some cases. And so there's the kind of phase phase one and phase two of the ad adoption of this stuff. And I think both of them are really important to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Something that we should get into is the obvious question of why is this time different? Because something, I think you wrote about this um, in the Times specifically, we'll link to the piece in the show notes, but there have been automation discussions before, 70s, industrial era, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But every time the typical economic response is, well, that's actually reallocating resources to a more productive part of the economy. Everyone does better. Yeah, we give up the horse and buggy and... That was an industry, but now we get cars and it's improved. Why is this time something where it's harder to see how that transition will seamlessly actually go about? Well, I started exactly in that place. I was very skeptical. I said, you know, we've dealt with this for hundreds of years. Like, why is this time different? And two things really convinced me. One is that it turns out that the other times kind of sucked. Like, if you actually go back and read huh. the literature, the newspaper reports, and the and the sort of coverage of, of industrial automation in the first industrial revolution, like, it was pretty bad for a lot of people. There was Dickensian, you know, horrible working conditions, you had child labor, um, right. and workers' wages actually didn't catch up to the increased productivity from the factories for like decades. So if you're like a worker who's in these factories doing this horrible work, like you're not actually seeing the gains from automation. You're just sort of paying the, the, the price of it. Um, so that's sort of, I think we romanticize like how easy it was for previous generations to deal with these, you know, technological changes, but it really does. Uh, it really does suck for a lot of people. And I think we, we, we miss that. And then the second thing that makes this that even if, even if, you know, that, part doesn't concern you, like the part that should concern you is that a lot of the automation we're seeing today is not the kind that actually creates new jobs to replace the old ones. Mm. So there's this concept that a couple of economists, um, uh, Daron Asamoglu and Pascal Ostrepo came up with, they, they call it so-so automation. And it's basically automation that is like barely good enough to replace a human, but not good enough to actually make the company that installs it like 10 times more productive or develop some amazing new product that's going to create tons of jobs for people down the road. And they're literally just saying like, what does Fred in finance do? And like, how can I program a bot to do exactly that? And maybe it's going to be a little worse than Fred, you know, but it's going to still sort of shave off costs out of our, out of our, you know, payroll. And so that's a good thing. So like an example of this would be like a call center that like gets automated and like, I don't know about you guys, but like when I get an automated response on a call center, like I'm hitting zero. Like, yeah, I'm, yeah. Like, I'm like, like I, I'm like, give me a human immediately because this sucks, right? It's like a bad experience, but yeah. it's so it's that's not a case where companies are deploying automation to like make their products better or like you know get into some amazing new market that's gonna like you know create tons of new jobs. It's like they're just replacing what a human did with like a slightly worse version that's much, much cheaper. The example you give that will resonate with literally anyone who lives in a major urban center is automated checkout 
as an oh. example of the definition of so-so yeah. <laughs> combined with the dynamic. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So th- that's a classic example. Like those, those things aren't good. Like they yeah. don't, <laughs> they don't um, make shopping any faster. They don't make groceries any cheaper. They're not creating, I mean, part of the, the thing that economists that make economists skeptical of this sort of automation is killing all the jobs argument is that the productivity statistics actually haven't really moved in the direction you'd expect them to. If AI and automation were creating all the, you know, we're killing all these jobs and making all these firms more productive, you would see like a sharp increase in productivity that you just don't see. So they've used that to say like, well, this isn't really happening. This is just a fake, you know, thing that people are worried about. But actually what, what Asamoglu and Restrepo write and what I find pretty persuasive is that it's not that people aren't being displaced out of their jobs. It's that they're being displaced with like pretty crappy robots, um, mm-hmm. like grocery store checkout counters that don't actually make the economy more productive. They just allow the store owner to stock, you know, to staff fewer workers on a shift. It just like, you know, marginally makes them more money and provides in some cases, a worse experience for customers. This is really important to understand, I think, for the what do we do about it question. This is something I talked with Andrew Yang about. He's been on the podcast. Yeah, I've talked to him a bunch of times about this. There's like the inevitableist case in which you're like, okay, this is going to happen. That's why we need UBI. There's like the more Luddite case of definitely which I probably used to more subscribe to, but don't anymore of, no, wait, like we have a choice. Like as a, as a country, as a government, we can say, no, like we are not going to do this. But there was something, it's not libertarian necessarily, but that you put forward, which I love, which is, wait, we also, as individuals, play a role in this. And so now that we've scared the shit out of people and we're like, hey, like, yes, automation could be coming for a job. The better part, I think the best part of your book is what can we do as individuals to make ourselves stand apart from machines and make sure that we're unautomatable, if that's the correct term. So go into that. You've got, you know, nine different rules um, and more. But just three. the top. Not the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to get the whole thing. Uh, yeah, but the well, top line. Give us a top line on like why we can be different from machines. Totally. So the book is divided into two parts. The first half is about the sort of diagnosis of of what's happening in the economy and what automation is doing. But then, and that's where the discussion usually stops. And that's the thing that really like I was so frustrated and pissed off about when I started researching this book. I was like, how has no one done the like, what do you do about it book? Like it's all about the problem and it's not about the solutions. Um, And and when you have people like Andrew Yang, who I think was right on a lot of this stuff, like he's talking about solutions on like a macro level with like UBI and Mm -hmm. sort of political economy questions but like it it almost felt like people were saying like you know there's a bear in the backyard and like all the solutions people are like well we could you know adapt like we could fix climate change so that they can hibernate um and maybe they won't come into people's houses and i'm thinking like how do i get the bear out of the yard like that's a problem um so i decided i since i couldn't find that book i just decided to write it and so the the Second half of the book is is nine sort of rules that people can follow to make their own careers and lives and communities more future proof. Um, and the top line is sort of that all of them involve becoming more human. Um, I think for a long time we've taught people and we've assumed that the way to prepare for the future is to like get really close to the machines. So major in STEM, you know, um, optimize your time so that you're never wasting any time so that you're a maximally efficient, you know, productivity machine, like learn to code, like all these things that we assumed would help people get a leg up in the new economy. Um, and that's really like not what I heard from the people I talked to for this book who are AI scientists and experts and CEOs. They said basically that we need to go in the opposite direction. We need to mm-hmm. help people do things that only humans can do uh, and that robots can't re- can't easily replicate. Um, and so there are three categories of work that I think are going to be very difficult for machines to do better than humans. Um, and that's, I call them surprising, social, and scarce. So surprising work is like work that involves like irregular environments, lots of changing variables. Like, like the example I use in the book is like AI is very good at like playing chess because chess has like set rules and it's a bounded environment and it's predictable and you can repeat it over and over and over again and get a little bit better each time. 
But like if you asked an AI to teach a kindergarten class, like it would be horrible at that because mm-hmm. there's so many variables. There's so many things going wrong all the time. And so those kind of chaotic, surprising jobs are, are fairly safe from automation. Um, social is the second category. And that's work that doesn't involve making things. It involves making people feel things. Um, so not only therapists and, you know, nurses and and providers in the social services um but jobs that you know involve art and 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 creativity um jobs that are not about sort of producing things as efficiently as as possible they're about sort of creating feelings in the people who encounter your work. Um, And then the third category is what I call scarce jobs, which doesn't mean that there are only a few of them. It just means that they're jobs that require sort of rare expertise, combinations of skills, people who are extraordinary standouts in their field. um, And, and people who like, when you, when you you don't always need them, but when you need them, you really need them. Like um, the classic example would be like 911. Like when you call 911, a human picks up and, the reason why is not because we can't automate those jobs. It's because we've decided it's unacceptable to automate those jobs. Because when you are in trouble and something's going wrong, you don't want to press zero. You want to talk to a human. And so those mm-hmm. jobs are are fairly protected as well. Interesting. The, the thing I want to take this to that I'm fascinated by is just the politics of it. Because in your piece in The Times, you just referenced the idea that a lot of corporations leaders, et cetera, were reluctant to automate because they saw the backlash against outsourcing 1980s, 1990s dynamics. So they just didn't want to touch that for pretty apparent reasons during the Trump era. But how would a backlash to this look, especially the white collar variety? Because a couple of things I want to hit too are the fact that there are a couple of trends that probably aren't in favor of white collar workers. So we have a lot of VCs on the podcast and they talk about how remote everywhere and it's great and it's awesome. And maybe that's great if you're a VC, but if actually, if you're a white collar worker, it's actually pretty terrible because remote anywhere doesn't just mean you move into Thailand. It means that actually if there's a country like India or Nigeria where there's high like English language, your white collar job could easily be outsourced to that. So there's this weirdly unoptimistic perspective that I'd be taking if I were a white collar employee, not a podcaster. I'm sorry, there's a solution there. But th- I think the I think the broad point though is what would backlash to this look like? I think it looks like what backlash has looked like since the Luddites. I mean, hmm. it, it it's uh, it's workers protesting. It's, you know, it's violence. Um hopefully that doesn't happen, but it's there's a historical precedent for it. Um and it's workers understanding that the tools that are being implemented are not there to make their lives better or to make them more money. It's, it's to exploit them. Um, and so I think, you know, we're starting to see that sort of happen. I mean, one advantage that actually sort of manufacturing jobs had is that they were largely unionized when yeah. their workplaces were automated. Um, and so unions were actually, I went back and read a bunch of the literature about the sort of automation boom of the 1970s in manufacturing work. And it was the unions who were doing things like insisting on, they had these worker automation councils inside the big car companies that, you know, before management would bring in a new robot to take over some part of assembly, they would consult with workers and they would ask them, you know, what tasks do you want to automate it? You know, what are the least fun parts of your job? How can we implement this in a way that's thoughtful and won't screw up your life? Like how, and, and, and most importantly, workers were able to negotiate for some of the economic upside of the automation. So it wasn't just corporate executives making more, it was it was workers making more too. And so I think that's what's really missing in the white collar world is the, is the organized labor component that could advocate for a bigger share of the proceeds from automation. So instead, you're going to see a lot of sort of, yeah, pe- people sort of organizing ad hoc uh, protests and stuff like that. But you're, I don't think we're going to see strikes and, and, you know, riots the way that we have in previous waves. Mm-hmm. Well, and what's, what's fascinating about this, and this is an excellent topic because it's one where the consensus is still forming. So the language doesn't quite work. So for example, I wouldn't quite describe accountants and other college educated people as workers, quote unquote, in the sense that previous persons who were subject to automation, globalization, et cetera, were, because if you are a university degree holding accountant, you actually, you're a professional and you actually have certain degrees of autonomy over your schedule and over your workplace that hasn't and correct me if I'm incorrect, but but doesn't seem to have been affected by previous waves. So I'm just struggling to see a world where you would see 
accountants and professionals of the world uniting against their corporate overlords because they're in a slightly different circumstance than workers traditionally were, who had unions, who had pensions, where there was this long, because to your point about this not evolving directly over time, unions, those work, those unions in the 70s, that took 80 years um, to actually develop. So I, I'm having a hard time seeing the mythos and the structure popping up in a th- two, three, four, five year period. But correct me if that's, in, if that's wrong. No, I think there's definitely like an element of this that you know, we as white collar workers are late to in the sense that Mm -hmm. we, we have not yet sort of recognized that we are under the, under the, the gun as much as, if not more so than, than the blue collar workers. Um, so I think trying to raise awareness of that is, is what I'm trying to do and not to make people alarmed, but just to say, Hey, this is happening and, and you got to prepare for it because you don't want to be taken by surprise. But I think, yeah, you're right that there aren't, we're not looking at a kind of slow, we don't have 80 years to do this. Um, right. Um, and so I think there are going to be things that sort of happen before we're ready for them. And, and by we, I mean the sort of workforce, uh, you know, us, us working stiffs who get a paycheck uh, for content. <laughs> every two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I mean content like, kings. you know, I'm in a, I'm in a union at the New York times and I, I, um, you know, our, contract actually has an automation clause in it, um, mm-hmm. which is not, which is something that you saw in a lot of, uh, contracts in manufacturing in the 20th century. Um, but that is relatively rare. That's fascinating. You know, I, I heard you talk about this and I wanted to talk about it a little bit, which is in media, how this has manifested itself could have several different fourth, third order effects whatsoever. It's like you were saying, you know, whenever we're, if things can be automated, then we have to make ourselves different. Um, I mean, I've certainly have like, you know, I was a White House correspondent. Now I have my show. I have this show as well, where I definitely say much more about what I think you were talking about how you write, you know, a tech column you write in the first person you write with interviews. It's a reported column. But at the end of the day, it is Kevin's view within the New York Times. And it's no secret, you know, the the Times hired friends of the show like Jaden Coaston. They've hired Kara Swisher and all this like leaning hard into the personality. You quite literally can't automate that but you could automate other parts of the job. How do you think it's going to change journalism like this degree? Because there's, you know, as, as somebody in the Times yourself, like you said, you have an automation clause. What what incentives does that tell the younger versions of us who are coming up in the business now? Yeah, I, th- I think you're really perceptive there. I mean, I think that people have been sort of sort of subconsciously doing these adaptations um, mm-hmm. for a long time. And so, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but part of the reason that I moved you know, out of the corporate earnings, you know, reporting mode um, and into stuff where I could be more opinionated and say more about what I thought is because I was worried about being replaced. Um, yeah. And and I wanted to make myself less replaceable either by a machine or by another, you know, human. Um, and so I think we're starting to see in, I mean, we've already seen in journalism a move away from kind of the institutional, you know, uh, pink slime work product, um, and toward these more like, I don't know if you'd call it like artisanal content, um, manufacturing. Right. So I, and I think that's going to be a, a big trend and I think there are, you know, upsides and downsides to that. But I think for people who can, you know, make the transformation, it's been, it's been pretty good. Um, I do think there are, hardships that are going to come out of that. I mean, we've already said, you know, some of the entry level journalism jobs, um, just, won't exist. Um, and so getting your foot in the door, um, you know, getting that first step on the career ladder so that you can eventually go and host your own, you know, podcast, like that's going to be a challenge for people. And so I think that's where we need to think about, okay, like how do we actually get people the skills that they need? Um, so that, because, you know, the traditional way of working yourself up is not going to, is not going to be very effective. Mm. And, and, you know, for the second half of this, let's pivot to the topic that most listeners are going to know you from, which is really um, your work around content moderation, YouTube, social media platforms, um, rabbit um, rabbit hole, um, excellent podcast that I suggest everyone listen to, narrative series. As I was listening, I just thought, well, okay, with automation, AI, whatever, some semblance of that, it seems like this is the perfect use case for a content problem 
moderation that could be solved for. Because if you actually look from a political perspective, so much of the debate comes around bias when it comes to moderation. It comes down to the fact that it's a terrible job to be a content moderator. It's the, I suggest people look into the stories of the people who are reviewing the violence, like the sexual, like actual, like sexual depravity that's seen there. It's 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 terrible. Can you speak to whether or not um, the content moderation issue is something that could be solved by AI automation, et cetera? I don't think so. I mean, this is an area where I think I, I differ from a lot of my sources. I mean, people who work at Facebook and Twitter, they'll tell you like, oh yeah, AI, machine learning, like they're going to be able to do content moderation. You know, they're already doing it and it's just a matter of time until the models get good enough to where they can accurately, um, you know, do that stuff. And that, you know, that might work for certain things. I mean, AI can, you know, say, is that a nipple or is that not a nipple? Like that's a, pretty easy mm -hmm. problem for and an even algorithm. that's a complicated question on Instagram too right true yeah true um, but there are certain ways in which you know automation has been really good for content moderation like for example taking down you know um, abusive material um, AI can go you know flag child sexual abuse material and take it down you know right before anyone sees it which I think is yeah. a good thing um, but there are the edge cases, right? The, the the really thorny ones that require context and historical knowledge. And, you know, is is this person joking when they say this? Is this satire? Is this, you know, are they doing um, sort of, yeah, Swiftian sort of mockery of something? Like, like those are the things that I think are going to be much harder for machines to do. And actually, that that the story of, of social media in the last five years is really a story of, of sort of de-automation. Um, hmm. These companies had very, very few humans uh, working for them relative to their their footprint, and in the past few years, what they've seen is that they need a lot more people um, because the machines aren't aren't doing everything, and so they've hired massive numbers of people to be content moderators and policy people, and and they've sort of they they automated stuff that maybe they realized they couldn't automate or shouldn't automate, and so they've been sort of backtracking on that. What I love about your articulation of the history there is you basically just illustrated that. There's no actual controversy in American politics about whether or not sexual abuse goes on Facebook or Twitter. That's a settled question, black and white, very straightforward. But it seems to me what you're saying is in the areas where there is actual conflict, in the actual areas where there seems to be serious social, cultural, political debate, are there any cases where, I guess, let's pretend, you know, I'm a Facebook executive. No, Derek, I, I sorry, Kevin, um... Um, no, Kevin, I promise we are going to solve the bias question through it. What would your response be? Well, I would just say, like, talk to Mark Zuckerberg about how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it certainly hasn't kept them out of trouble. Um, mm. But I think I, I think the the thing that you're you're hinting at there is that there's a there used to be a job called editor, you know, and there were people who were trained and unionized and paid well, and th their job was to decide what is beyond the pale and what is not. And there's still some of them around. I have some great ones. Um, but a lot of that is being done by algorithms now that say this is okay, this is not okay. Um, and by low paid content moderators that you're talking about in these sort of content moderation farms. Um, and so I think that sort of the the judgment call, the sort of discretion, the, the piece of it that is really hard is the part that editors used to do. And I think if these companies are smart, they will start treating that as an, as an editor function, not just a, a content moderator function and sort of paying people and treating them accordingly. Mm. See, this is where it gets thorny. And cards on the table, large anti-establishment audience here. And all of there are like, mm, I don't really want an editor at Facebook, or I don't really want uh, these people to be deciding what I see and what I don't. And especially, and I, you know, it's funny you you brought this up. We've had like the rise of human uh, human centric decision making. I've actually seen it bifurcate in terms of left and right, both being more pissed off about the human centered decisions. So when we talk about this. What are the frameworks that we're going to use? I think you're, uh, I wouldn't say you're famous for, but you're famous amongst a certain set for the realities are column, which if you read it, um, what you were proposing is a unified branch, you know, within the government that coordinates already. We have election disinformation office within the FEC. We have a COVID-19, you know, disinformation within the CDC. Having a government person oversee that, I think it's fine. It obviously, though, struck a nerve um, amongst a lot of people because they, you know, distrustful of the New York Times, particularly distrustful of people within Facebook who would then maybe use the Times. 
What do you think that the reaction to that column tells you about that feeling that I think a lot of our audience is immediately saying, well, hold on a second, Kevin, I'm not sure I necessarily trust you or any editor that Facebook is going to hire in order to make content moderation decisions for me. Yeah, that's fine. I don't have any problem with people thinking yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm an idiot or, or wrong yeah. about things. Uh, I frequently am an idiot and wrong about things. So I appreciate it being called out. That one in particular was, it was not, it was weird to like get called out for that because it was actually not mm. my idea. Um, but I, I do think the sort of backlash has proved that, you know, we want people to be accountable. I think that like, you know, the sort of thing that legacy media has that digital media doesn't have is like a human accountability structure. So like hmm. someone, you know, publishes something in a newspaper that you don't like, you can yell at, you, like, you know who did that and you know who can yell at them or you can go yell at them. But like with tech companies, it's all sort of obfuscated behind this like, you know, technical jargon and, you know, it's the algorithm decided and we didn't decide. So, and it's sort of designed to kind of shield them from accountability. And to the extent that I think people are realizing that, yeah, they're there are people at these companies who make these decisions. I think that's a good thing. I think it's good mm. to have that piece of the sort of Wizard of Oz, like Mirage toppled. Um, and and I think that, you know, we need to understand that like even algorithms ref reflect choices that humans make. Um, Kathy O'Neill is a, a writer who writes a lot about AI and automation, says that um, algorithms are opinions embedded in code. And, and I really like that because I think we, we make the mistake of assuming that there's humans and then there's algorithms, but who do you think builds the algorithms Yes, um, and tells them what to do? So yeah, I, I think it's going to be a gnarly um, transition. We're still figuring out like what the proper amount of moderation is. Um, the answer clearly isn't zero. Um, you know, we tried that. It was called 8chan and a lot of mass terrible. murderers used it. Right. So um, I think everyone agrees that there's some line beyond which you shouldn't let something on your social network, but we're going to continue to litigate that and people are going to continue, you know, yelling about it and writing about it in their sub stacks. And I'm sure I'll, I'll bear the brunt of that. But <laughs> I think this is a healthy process. I don't think there's anything yeah. wrong with saying we're not OK with Mark Zuckerberg making the decisions that govern speech for you know billions of people. That doesn't seem like a, a good system. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's, it's fascinating, too, because. I was reading the column, and it's like I said, I didn't even really disagree with the idea of like CDC and more within there. The question is always whenever we branch into the edge cases and like where we listen. So for example, like CDC is take is advising YouTube to take videos down, being like, drink bleach. Yeah, I pretty cool with everybody taking that down. A little more of them pretty cool. We yeah, like, firmly endorse I not firmly drinking support, bleach here. Like, do not drink bleach. <laughs> take a video down of telling people to drink bleach. Like, I think that's good. But then the edge cases, I mean, for example, like you put in your column talking about um, the lab leak theory as something that might be disinformation, but that's something that the New York Times itself has reported on like more recently as, of, you know, credible theory. So like, how are we supposed to think about that, like, I, I think you use the word baseless, then it comes out and it's not necessarily, you know, at least very much highly within dispute. I'm not blaming you necessarily. I'm just giving it as an example of, well, if you're going to put that forward, that could be, you know, a lot of influential people read it. The CDC could say, oh, well, this is a baseless conspiracy theory and they could take down videos on that. So when we begin to get into the edge cases, how are you thinking about that in particular? Yeah, well, I, I think... Again, I think it comes down to accountability. And um, I think these tech companies don't want to be seen as making these decisions themselves um, because they don't want the blowback from that. And so they pawn it off on the CDC. They say, we'll just follow whatever the, whatever the CDC says, we'll do that. Right. Uh, and so that's a way of them sort of evading accountability for their own choices um, in ways that I don't think are great. Um, <laughs> I also think, you know, there, there are... I mean, part of what being an editor means is, is taking context into account, you mm. know, is, is it, are we in a moment where, you know, we're just doing healthy disagreement and the cost of being wrong, um, and of allowing, you know, bad information to propagate is, is not very major, or are we in the middle of a global pandemic when, you know, massive millions of people are, you know, refusing to get vaccinated or wear masks because, they saw some crazy meme on their Facebook feed. Like that is a, a moment of heightened sensitivity. And like any editor will tell you, like there are certain topics that get more scrutiny than others and certain times that warrant more caution than others. And I think what the social networks are saying now is this is a really 
crucial time. It's really critical that people get good information now so that they can make good decisions that protect themselves and other people. And so I think, you know, they're cracking down harder on misinformation about COVID than they are, you know, they're not, they're not, they don't have huge task force going after like, you know, Bigfoot conspiracy theories Mm -hmm. because those don't have a, a big cost attached to them. Yeah. And what's so tough about this is everything in American society inevitably becomes political. So it's hard to look at these things without that. But something I just wonder within the reality crisis framework is, is it possible that this issue, at least in our current context, is semi-solving itself in the sense that Donald Trump is off Twitter, he's off Facebook. I think it's anecdotal, but I genuinely feel as if both platforms feel less toxic now that that's in effect. Um, At the same time, President Biden is doing a good job of just not engaging in the type of, once again, toxic social media conflicts that drive a lot of the toxicity and he's focused on the deeper things. So is it possible that there was this very specific moment in January of 2021 where everything you're writing about, everything you're podcasting about in very literal terms, not to underplay it, the worst case articulation of what would happen happened. But because of the way Biden's handling it and because of the fact that Twitter's changing, right? You know, Twitter is, I see you have a review, Substack, not Substack, you have a review um, newsletter, which Twitter required, Uh, not a Substack. So Twitter is going to long form, super follows, pay for tweets. You have apps like Clubhouse, which are less, there's, they're algorithmic, but they're less algorithmic. It's based upon voice. There isn't the application. Is it possible that there was just this moment that we are semi-organically moving beyond? How, How do you think about that? I think it's totally possible that we had sort of an aberration in the past, you know, four years um, because of the political environment, because the tech platforms were kind of asleep at the wheel in 2016 and didn't see, you know, how their platforms were being abused and manipulated and that they're more attentive right now. I would characterize that as actually not an organic evolution. Like there are a lot of people Mm -hmm. who worked very, very hard to get these platforms to take this stuff more seriously um, and, and, you know, to take domestic extremism more seriously, Mm -hmm. to take QAnon more seriously. I mean, that didn't just happen. Um, But I think, I think, you know, what you're saying is like, will this just work itself out? And I don't think it will. I think it requires, Hmm. um, I think it requires us to engage, um, and, and dispute and argue and, and, you know, have these conversations and conflicts out in the open, because ultimately what happens when we don't do that is that the tech companies do whatever they want, um, with no accountability. And that's, we've seen how that ends and it's not good. And let me clarify this because when I said work itself out, I didn't. And you correct. I meant more in the civil society. Everyone's doing things, and that produces some sort of result. Um, but no, I, I think that's helpful. What were you saying, Sagar? Yeah, I just I don't know. I'm, I'm curious because I read there was a news. I think it was a it was an Axios this morning about how like news traffic is down 28. percent I mean, look, like maybe that's a net good. Right. Like maybe it isn't that good that Biden is not president. There's a 28 percent drop in news traffic. Yeah, that actually means a lot less interactions and hate and more. But like that seems I'm not going to say that that is a way that it worked itself out. But people can't be more pissed about X, Y and Z whenever they're literally not reading the news, which I actually think is generally a good thing. I'm curious. I mean, from your perspective on the misinformation debate, one of the things I've always really bothered me is like, okay, well, like how exactly did we get, um, you know, X millions number of people who are willing to believe X or Y? And this is a right and left problem, I can tell you, if having been hated by both sides um, whenever it comes to this. Do you see any real grappling with that? And I'm not apologizing for QAnon and I'm not apologizing for like left-wing violence either, but there is very clearly like a hole in the center of a lot of our country in terms of trust in institutions and general just like decline in civic discourse and more that has led to a point where people do this. I guess my main question is, is like, is this on the tech platforms? Is this a politico cultural problem? Is it even like ascended before that? What do you think uh, just generally on the matter as somebody who reports on this? Well, I think there are two sides of it, right? There's supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Um, The supply side is the tech platforms. And that's the part that, you know, I think for the last few years, people have been grappling with and, you know, raising awareness of is like, 
there is a supply problem. You know, if if you have a tech platform and it's 80%, you know, conspiracy theories, that's not that's not <laughs> reflective of the world. That's a warped thing. Yeah. Um, and so that's you know, has all kinds of negative outcomes for society. And I think, you know, we were right collectively to sort of worry about that and to take that seriously because there was a real supply problem. Um, and and I think there's an underappreciation of the demand side. I think we need to start paying more attention to why people gravitate toward these things and why it is QAnon growing so quickly. You know, why mm-hmm. is, you know, why are extremist movements um, able to recruit, you know, on the people that they are. It's not, people aren't just, you know, mindless brainwashed sheep being led, you know, in different directions. They're, they're choosing, they're seeking this stuff out. And so you see this even with, you know, some of the attempts to take down some, you know, COVID misinformation or something like that. Like people actively go seek it out. It's not just that they're being fed this stuff through an algorithm. So I think that's, that's a, a question that I'm sort of above my pay grade, but I think, I think it's the experts that I've talked to say it's largely, um, you know, that the demand side is not as simple to solve because there you're not talking about, you know, one algorithm controlled by one company. Um, you're talking about millions of people and the various things that, you know, motivate and, and, and inspire them. Um, and I talked to a bunch of people, including for the, the column you mentioned about the reality crisis that said basically Mm -hmm. that the way to, the way that combat domestic extremism and conspiracy theories is to improve people's material conditions, is to give them stimulus checks, is to, you know, end the pandemic, get them outside talking to their friends and family again. Um, I really think we are going to be seeing the effects of the social isolation of COVID-19 for decades. Um, 100% agree with that. And I think that, you know, that's a, that's a missing piece of this debate is like, what are the things that are actually keeping people out of these movements and how can we get more of that into their lives? Yeah. So for our last section here, we really love doing book shows. So I want to just get updates on your two, your two, your first two books, um, Young Money, which, and the reason why we're talking about this is I think, I think both books were really spoke to very specific moments in American politics and just life in general. So um, The Unlikely Disciple, which was about your time at a prominent Christian conservative college, which brought back Bush, just looking it up on Amazon, <laughs> it feels very, holy crap, Bush just won re-election, the yeah. theocracy. They're so, I'm not saying that's what you're saying, but th- that was very much, if you if you lived anywhere blue, if you lived in any blue state, that whole, like, we're going to secede to Canada, that really spoke to that moment. And then the second book, Young Money, um, which is about Wall Street after the financial crisis, which becomes incredibly relevant. Um, I was actually just listening to it on Audible because it's fascinating to listen to this um, in the context of Wall Street bets and the broader rhetoric and narrative there too. So can you just, for our last bit here, can you just update us on your thinking around like the first topic, Christians in America, especially younger Christians, um, and then young money um, with Wall Street um, finance. I take it the issues were not resolved, um, which explains why we are where we are today. <laughs> That's a great question. Actually, I hadn't thought about it in those terms. So thank you for for giving me the perspective on why I make the decisions I make. <laughs> <laughs> what to write there about. Um, the evangelical community is, is super interesting. I mean, what what you've basically seen in the last four years is that uh, religious um, identification has become much less salient and political identification has become much yes. more salient. So young evangelicals don't say I'm a young evangelical. They say I'm a Democrat or I'm a Trump supporter or mm-hmm. you know some variation on that. And so that's something that I think... Um, has been happening and will continue to happen. A lot of the young evangelicals, I guess, you know, people my age are not so young anymore. We're 30 in our thirties. Um, but the, the evangelicals I know around my age have really sort of polarized in the same way that the country at large has either. They, you know, take their Christianity to mean like we need to advocate for social justice and raise the minimum wage and do all these sort of lefty priorities, or, you know, they're on board with MAGA and they, you know, they, they're sort of Christian um, fundamentalists who sort of believe that Donald Trump is the second coming. And um, and there's not all that much in between. And I think that mirrors the shift in the country more generally. Um, with the Wall Street thing, that was fascinating because that was like, you're right, that was like a post-crash um, yeah. book. And, and a lot of the young people I was profiling were sort of struggling to, you know, figure out whether they wanted to work on Wall Street or not. And was it worth it for the money and was it making them miserable and and um and the conditions around that have really changed too i mean 
Um, now, if you are graduating from Stanford or Harvard or Princeton, um, you don't want to work on Wall Street anymore. <laughs> like you want to go work at Google. Yeah. Because um, they will pay you just as much and you'll get free food and you can wear, you know, flip flops to work and you don't have to, you know, spend all day making small talk, you know, with, with, you know, wasps from Greenwich. And, um, and so a lot of the sort of energy that used to go into finance now goes into tech, um, which is part of what got me interested in writing about tech. I was watching all my sources leave, you know, big banks and go work in tech. And I was like, there's something happening here that is really hmm. interesting. So to fuse fuse your two dis, dis, disciplines here, uh, what did you make of Wall Street bets, GameStop? I mean, there's obviously been endless takes. I've been guilty of, of firing off a few myself. Some of us just couldn't help it in the heat of the moment. I mean, now that we, you know, we've had like a month to digest it, it does just seem genuinely fascinating to see this guy who points out something on Reddit gets basically enough people to believe him. It turns into a cause celeb. It turns into revenge for the financial crisis amongst some of the Wall Street guys that you That's covered. Whole, I mean, the, well, well, I'm saying it turned into a narrative around that, not yeah. that it necessarily worked out. Actually, some hedge funders got quite rich off of the, wall, the Redditors themselves. What, so what did you make both of the takes and of the actual incident themselves? I, yeah, I thought it was fascinating. I was yeah. totally obsessed with that story. Yeah. And I, I, I like read everything, watched everything, like was glued to it in a way that I don't think I've been in a long time to a story. Um, and I think part of what's fascinating is that it felt so inevitable. I mean, we've mm -hmm. seen Wall Street bets happening to every institution, um, to the media, to, you know, to higher education, to, you know, there have been sort of this, this um, dismantling of authority and this sort of skepticism for like the official explanation for things or the the people who are sort of, um, you know, telling you that this is the way it is. Like we've seen sort of bottom up movements disrupt all those things. And, and the mystery to me was why it wasn't happening to Wall Street yet. Um, and, and there you go. It's, it's, um, it's, it's now happening and now every hedge funder has in the back of their mind, like what if Reddit piles onto this trade <laughs> in the other direction and it's, uh, you know, it's become something that they have to think about. So I, I think it's totally fascinating. You know, I'm a, I'm a crusty old institutionalist. Like I, 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 I work at, you know, a 170 year old newspaper <laughs> and, uh, and I like it. So I'm, I'm maybe, you know, I'm not, um, but I'm not like spiritually, um, you know, uh, skeptical of the wall street bets people. I think, I think what they did is fine. And, um, mm -hmm. and I, I think it's going to keep happening more. I'm just interested as an observer of this stuff at the way social media is, is sort of disrupting every institution. Um, and I think we're, I think that's going to be the story of, of our time is sort of automation, social media, and how they are filtering down into culture and, and commerce and politics. So 100% agree. For our last cue here, now that I've put forth the thesis that ties together your three very topically separate books, what is the inkling of what your Biden era book, or at least topic, not the book, but what is a very forward looking Biden era topic that you'd be interested in exploring next? Because I just, I love how like genuinely diverse your space has been. Um, like, what's something you're just thinking about that has nothing to do with the three topics we mentioned? Hmm. Um, I, I'm really interested in, um, sort of the, the return of community. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, you know, what we've been seeing now for decades is sort of, you know, this bowling alone thing of people, you know, they're not joining clubs, they're not doing bowling leagues, they're not, you know, they're not joining their church choir, you know, there's a sort of flight from community. Um, and I think, I think, you know, what's going to come out of the pandemic is some people, you know, introverts, people who, who never wanted to like be part of those groups anyways, have probably done okay psychologically during the pandemic. But there are a lot of people who are going to rush out as soon as the, as soon as it's safe to do, and they're going to join their local knitting club. They're going to, you know, they're going to go to concerts. They're going to go to church. They're going to, you know, people were social animals. Right. And so I think the, the Biden years, you know, there'll obviously be tons of stories about technology, but I think we're starting to see now that people are really aware of 
what's happening to them as a result of technology, that they've become more atomized, more polarized, more maybe more extreme in what they believe. And so I think actually things like Clubhouse are super interesting to me. Just mm-hmm. technology aside, it's just like a, a different kind of conversation is happening there. Um, and I think that's in some cases a response to how people are feeling about what social media has done to them um, and wanting an escape from that. Completely agree. We both have been enjoying Clubhouse. Maybe we'll see you on there sometime soon, Kevin. So we appreciate you joining us, man. Fantastic book. Can you tell everybody where do you have a preference for where people buy it or anywhere you like? You can go to futureproofthebook.com and all the links are right there. Buy it on your platform of choice. Um, Download it on the dark web, whatever. Uh, <laughs> it will also be available on our bookshop. An, so make it into an NFT it and, and yes. you know, sell it for a million dollars, whatever. <laughs> Just uh, you can sign See, up there. And I also I want to buy. It. I want to buy the original copy of your book on the NFT. Let's start a bidding process. I've been I've been project. thinking about yeah. it. I'm not sure how Random know. House would feel about that, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll talk to him. Man, someone's gonna be the edge case for that. You're, yeah, yeah, that's gonna the, gonna if you, if you gonna just, happen. Yeah, that's the that's the thing. Yeah. Okay, totally. thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, thanks guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.